and I hope you delete all that other stuff we just talked about. So anything that's going to get my wife to slap me, I don't want. <laughs> that's most of what we just talked about. So you're right. I will have to delete most of that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast, your weekly adventure into Star Trek, the original series. Your hosts, as always, Dan Calzaretta and Dana Smith. Good evening, Dan. Dana, how are you doing this evening? Good. We're supposed to be getting some rain, so if uh, you're thunder in the background, it will be thunder and nothing else. So <laughs> it won't have anything to do with possibly something you ate today or anything like that. No, no, not at all. Okay, it'll be real thunder. <laughs> So, Dan, tonight we're going to discuss uh, The Deadly Years, which is uh, Season 2, Episode 12. But first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, last week's episode, Friday's Child, which uh, co-starred Julie Newmar, by the way. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, well, she should have been in every episode of everything. We did get some comments. Why don't we talk about those? Yeah, let's do it. Start off, uh, Robert James said, uh, I guess this is not the episode to say poor Schmitter. I think that's in reference to the sandwich we discovered. Right. I, have you tried that yet? Have you tried making one? No, I didn't. Would have entailed me going out to the store and buying the ingredients. And, <laughs> uh... <laughs> I do want to make one. I think they would be quite tasty. I mean, I like all the ingredients in them, but I haven't made one yet. I think it would be fun to, to do that and maybe try them actually on the podcast. Yeah, we should. Definitely. Robert didn't just finish with that. He also said Julie Newmar was freaking awesome in this episode. I tend to agree. Now, you didn't write that one and use the name Robert, did you? <laughs> no, no. Okay. See, I'm not alone in my love for Julie Newmar. I mean, I thought she was good in the episode, but I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not saying anymore. <laughs> yeah. Don't speak poorly about Julie. No. Or Ms. Newmar. Mar, as we call her. Our good friend Olivia wrote to us, says, one thing I can't really get over is the carpet costumes. <laughs> she says, it looks like they took their granny's fringe rug, wrapped it around themselves, and called it fashion. Oh, this is the Capellans, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that until she said that. Olivia also commented that she loved all the slapping action we got in this episode and that final bit of banter at the end between the main trio. Also, I never thought of it before you guys mentioned it. But now that the idea is out there, I'm definitely betting that that is McCoy's actual baby. And she said, amazing episode as always. And I look forward to next week. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. That was great. And I am glad that we have another person on board with the McCoy's love child theory. Oh, I think there's several people that uh, agree with us on that, Dan. Ryan Whiteside said, underrated episode for sure. DeForest Kelly is great. Absolutely. Paul Bourne said, ah, the pleasure of stepfatherhood. He says, I knew McCoy had it in him. So, Dan, those are the comments we got from Facebook. Do you got any other emails or uh, anything from YouTube? Yeah, we just have one from YouTube this week, Dana, about Friday's child. Julie says, now, could be Julie Newmar. Not sure. Maybe it is, Dana. <laughs> Hold on. What if it is? We're responding back and we're getting a conversation going. It says, this is Julie Newmar. I will never be on a podcast with Dana. <laughs> But Dan, if you want to hang out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Julie does say, this episode is fantastic, if only for Elian and McCoy. You know, giving herself some props there if it's Julie Newmar. Yeah. You did hear something about Julie Newmar this week on Facebook from one of our listeners, though, didn't you? Yeah, Dan. She's going to be at a convention, a Comic-Con convention in Rhode Island. Well, I did see that Julie Newmar, I think to get an autograph, was either 60 or $80, I think depending on what body part you wanted autographed. <laughs> Then I think you can get like a picture taken with her for another certain amount of money. So this is, I think, how some of the stars make a living now, right? Yeah. All right. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll end up meeting her. That would be, that would be fun. Dan, let's get on with the deadly years. So we see a landing party beam down to Gamma Hydra 4. It's Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Lieutenant Galway, and Chekhov. First thing Kirk notices is no one is around. Spock comments that they were expected. Routine checks on outposts are planned well in advance. 
Kirk says he spoke with a Robert Johnson, a leader of the expedition. Wasn't Robert Johnson a legendary blues guy? Yeah, he's the guy that supposedly sold his soul to the devil. Yeah. At the crossroads. Yep. He wrote that song, right? Yep, that's right. Robert Johnson wrote it. And then Robert Johnson had like one album and that was it. Yeah. Anyway, would have been cool if Robert Johnson was there on the planet. But uh... yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it would have been very cool. Like just singing some blues music, you know? Yeah. They all kind of branch out to see if they can find anybody. And Chekhov goes into this building. The room is dark. Then the lights come on and he sees a very old dead guy on the table that scares the bejesus out of him. He goes screaming out of the building and and calls for Captain Kirk and the rest of the landing party comes back in to check on him. McCoy scans the body and says, death by natural causes, old age. Now, Dana, the thing that surprised me about that scene was that Chekhov has seen other dead bodies. He has seen people get killed in other episodes by the screaming. The guy was kind of scary looking. He was a little, yeah. Yeah. Kind of dried up, very wrinkly. I, I think it just was a surprise and that's what scared him. Yeah. So, uh, do you, hold on, one more question for you, sorry. <laughs> do you think that body was just like a mannequin, or do you think that was an actor just laying very still? Kind of looked like a real person to me, didn't you think so? I thought so too. And whenever I see that, I'm looking to see if I can see any, you know, see them breathing or anything, or the eyes moving. Remember, we saw one episode early, early on, and the guy blinked, he was dead, but he was blinking or something. But that's maybe that's why they only showed the guy for a couple seconds. Could be. You didn't get like a long look at him. So Spock says it's impossible that this guy died of old age. He says the entire colony had no one over 30. Just then, two more old people come into the building. And it's Robert Johnson, uh, who claims to be only 29 years old. And his wife, Elaine, who claims to be 27. And they are like way old. Old. Yeah, they look like they're in their late 80s. I thought they were both great character actors, by the way. Oh, yeah. The guy that played Robert Johnson, I've, I saw him in a lot of stuff in like the 60s. He was a great character actor. Back on the ship, the captain's log explains that of the six members on the colony, only Robert Johnson and his wife were still alive and the others had died of old age. In sick bay, Kirk is trying to talk to Robert Johnson. McCoy says he can hear you, Jim but he can't understand. Kirk and McCoy go to the briefing room where Commander Stalker and Dr. Janet Wallace are there along with Spock and a couple other members of the crew. Dr. Wallace is a specialist in endocrinology. Okay, okay, hold a sec. (laughs) Why? Number one, number one, why is she on the ship even, right? And number two, why is she dressed like somebody out of a circus? I mean, she's got a weird (laughs) kind of costume on. It looks like someone who might do a trapeze type of thing. I mean, it's just weird looking, Dana. And the hair, I mean, just the whole, her whole setup was just odd. She sure wasn't Julie Newmar. That's all I can say. No, she wasn't. Yeah, and what's an endocrinologist doing on the Enterprise? That's exactly my point. Yeah. And how did McCoy feel about that? Do you think he felt a little threatened? (laughs) It just seems like they always have the right person on the ship. You know, like the historian who was on the ship when they found Khan. and For uh, who mourns for Adonais, she was like the expert in... Ancient civilizations. Yeah, Yeah, that's what it was. Ancient civilizations just happened to be on the Enterprise. Yeah, and then uh, Dr. Noel, psychiatrist, when they go to the psychiatrist. Planet. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Never know when you're going to need those people. McCoy states that the people are suffering from old age and they are growing older by the minute. He hasn't a clue as to what's causing it. Kirk says they are close to the Romulan neutral zone and maybe this is some new weapon the Romulans are testing out. So I actually kind of like this part, Dana, that one, we learn they're near the Romulan neutral zone and two, that Kirk is already thinking this could be some type of weapon. That I thought would have made a really cool storyline as well. Oh, yeah, I agree. So uh, Stalker points out that he's anxious to get to Starbase 10 and Kirk is like, yep, yep, no problem. And then after one, everyone leaves, Kirk and Dr. Wallace are left alone. Kirk gets this <laughs> look on his face. <laughs> Did you see this? Little, like kind of like little smirk that he gets. And oh, yeah. And he says, is there something he can do for her? <laughs> yeah, there's something he can do. <laughs> yeah. You could see she's all smiles and he asks how long it's been. And she says six years, four months and an odd number of days. So the women that Kirk has been with remember to the day, yeah. apparently last time that he saw him because uh, the lawyer in the court martial said something yep. similar. It was like four years, six months, and an odd number of days. Yeah. And Kirk is like, who are you? I Do, do I know you? <laughs> yeah. 
I was going to go back to Commander Stalker. What is Commander Stalker doing on the ship? It's Commodore, by the way. Oh, Commodore. Okay. Did I say Commander? I don't know what you. I don't know because <laughs> again, I can't remember two minutes ago, Dana. So. <laughs> I've got the old age thing like these guys in the show, but Commodore Stalker, is he just like hitching a ride? Is that what he's doing or? They're supposed to take him to Starbase 10 for something. But we don't know like how he got on the ship, where he got on the ship. They're like the subway, you know, just have to be passing his way and he jumps on. Do you think it's kind of like if you work in the airline industry, you can just hop on a flight as long as they got a seat, you know, and, and you get a free ride somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Commodore's like, hey, I need to go to Starbase 10. You know, here I am at Starbase 8. The Enterprise is here. I'll just hop aboard and. Sure. So back to uh, Kirk and uh, Dr. Wallace. Kirk kind of says it's uh, it's been a long time. Things wouldn't change if we started all over again, would it? And so, you, you know, right away, he set up this whole backstory that something didn't end well. And Wallace responds, in all those years, I only heard from you once. You fucking arrogant bastard. I'm going <laughs> to kick you in the balls. <laughs> So she says a stargram when my husband died. So my first thought was that Kirk was messing around with a married woman. Yeah, that's what I was hoping that was going to be the case. <laughs> then she says, you know, you never asked me why I got married after we called it off. And Kirk actually seems a little, I don't know, upset's the right word. Affected, maybe? Yeah. Infected. He could have been infected. Maybe that's why he dumped her. <laughs> yeah. So he says, uh, he goes to her and then he, uh, he it looks like he's going to kiss her. And then he gets hailed to go to the bridge. You see, I got a problem with this whole part, Dana. And I want to premise this first by saying I really like this episode. But this whole sidetrack was a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. It didn't lead anywhere in the episode. They could have easily have not had this person in the show and the episode would have been just fine. I, I just found this to be distracting and frankly kind of stupid. Except for the fact that she was really into old men. Yeah. I was going to say, it comes up later that uh, she's got a, a thing for older men. So on the bridge, Spock reports reports that Hydra Gamma 4 is a Class M planet. Go figure. He says there was a rogue comet that passed by, they, and they're checking on that. Commodore Stalker then calls Kirk and tells him Starbase 10 has advanced facilities that could help with this investigation. And Kirk says the Enterprise is well equipped and they'll be fine. And stop bringing up Starbase 10. <laughs> <laughs> you keep talking to me about Starbase 10. I don't care. You've got a free ticket. So you're stuck. We'll put you back down on the planet in Hydra Gamma 4 and you can just become an old man there. Kirk tells Sulu to maintain standard orbit and Sulu says, You already gave that command, sir. Oh? Well, follow it. And he gets on the turbo lift <laughs> and Sulu kind of looks at Spock and we see Spock's face and Spock looks a little concerned. Then sickbay, Lieutenant Galway enters. She tells McCoy she's having a little trouble hearing and McCoy says it's nothing to worry about. Well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. This, this part, without even like examining her, he's like, oh, it's nothing to worry about. Nothing a little sonic cleaning won't clean out all that gunk that's in your ears. The only thing I could think of was her ear canals must be filled <laughs> with like nasty space wax or something. We're just going to shoot a high-powered laser in your ear, and I'll take care of it. <laughs> so we cut to Kirk's quarters where he is shirtless. Yeah, we got one. <laughs> and he calls Spock for a progress report. So wouldn't you put your shirt on before you called Spock? Yeah, and the way he was standing in front of the camera would be like, Spock wouldn't even be able to see his face. <laughs> He'd be looking at his navel. <laughs> Completely hairless, though. Do you notice that? He doesn't have any hair on his chest, none on his arms. And he's also hairless in real life, right? So he's bald. <laughs> Spock says all the research lines are negative, and Kirk says, well, there was a comet that passed by, and check into that, and Spock says, we're already doing that. Kirk looks momentarily confused and says, uh, yes, let me know what you come up with. So we were getting the idea here that Kirk is starting to lose his mental faculties, right? Yeah, he's starting to age. That's what I quickly guessed. Yeah, I mean, that's the implication for sure. So back in sickbay, McCoy and Chapel are covering up the body of Robert Johnson. McCoy reports cause of death, old age. So just then, uh, Scotty comes in, and Scotty looks really old and gray. Really old. Like, he looks way older than anybody else. And they're shocked, right? I mean, McCoy and Kirk are absolutely shocked. Yeah. So McCoy, whose hair is now growing longer and gray, I think they borrowed uh, Chekhov's wig and uh, dyed it gray for him. They needed to reuse those. I mean, you don't just want to throw those away. So he says, All of us who went down to the surface, with the exception of Chekhov, are aging at Bayer's rate. Uh, approximately 30 years for each day. 
I don't know what's causing it, virus, bacteria, or evil spirits, but I'm trying to find out. And his southern accent's getting thicker, too, as he's getting older, right? Yeah. So Kirk uh, Spock, who states that his estimate gives them a week to live. Mental faculties are aging faster than their bodies. He says, we'll all be mental vegetables sooner rather than later. Kind of like people that listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk orders research technicians working around the clock and figure out why Chekhov isn't affected. Stupid Russian. God, these Russians, man. I should just throw him off the ship. He probably voted for Putin. So. <laughs> <laughs> The whole time that they're talking about this, Chekhov is like on one of the medical beds doing tests. Then McCoy dismisses Lieutenant Galway and says uh, she doesn't want to go back to her quarters. And she looks older than anyone. Yeah. And she kind of looks like either one of the munchkins from The Wizard of Oz or maybe one of the flying monkeys from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I'm going with the monkey. Yeah, I think you're right. Kirk says to her, he goes over to her and he's like trying to encourage her to go back to her like station on the ship, right? Yeah. And and he says, Lieutenant Galway, assume the position. <laughs> Isn't that what he said? <laughs> he did. Yeah, I meant to write that down. What position is he talking about? <laughs> I think he meant assume your position. So Kirk turns back to McCoy after she leaves and says uh, she's 10 years younger than him. Outside of sick bay, Dr. Wallace is waiting for Kirk. She says uh, no problem is insoluble, not even ours. She says she's not over Kirk. And at this point, Kirk is looking like a 60-year-old man. Not as good as you and I look. I was just going to say, he. yeah, we're in our 60s and early, early, very early 60s. Kirk stops and asks how much older was your husband and she kind of looks at him funny and she says 26 years and Kirk says well, look at me what do you see and he says what do you offer me love or going away present there's only so much you can read into that right what marriage no that's not what they're talking about no, no. <laughs> and she's got this whole grandfather thing going on too doesn't she oh yeah she's yeah on the bridge Chekhov is lamenting all the physicals he's had some more blood Chekhov a needle wouldn't hurt, Chekhov. Take off your shirt, Chekhov. Roll over, Chekhov. Breathe deeply, Chekhov. Blood sample, Chekhov. Marrow sample, Chekhov. Skin sample, Chekhov. If, if I live long enough, I'm going to run out of samples. You'll live. Oh, yes, I'll live. But I won't enjoy it. Well, that was awesome. Yeah, another good line for Chekhov. It, it seems like no matter who the writer of the episode is, they're giving him these funny lines. I'm sure, you know, Roddenberry as the executive producer was like, look, Chekhov is comic relief. Yeah. So uh, later we see Kirk is asleep in the captain's chair. I love that scene. Love it. I, I feel like that a lot these days, you know, I'm maybe trying to watch a movie or something and all of a sudden I wake up and I'm like, what, what happened? So Spock comes around and uh, kind of like shakes him a little bit and wakes him up. Stalker is standing there watching. Spock reports that the orbit of Gamma Hydra 4 went directly through the comet's tail. Undetected radiation residue from the comet is the cause for what is ailing them. Kirk says, great, let's go see McCoy. Then he stops it and tells you her to send a message to Starfleet using code 2 since the Romulans might be in the area. Uhura looks at him kind of strange and says the Romulans have broken code 2. And Kirk says, well then use code 3. <laughs> He was kind of pissed a little bit. Kirk states in his report that the affliction appears to be the comet that passed by the planet. Kirk then asks Sulu to increase the orbit to 20,000 perigee. Sulu says, you mean another 20,000, sir? And Kirk gets kind of surly and complains about everyone questioning his orders. And then they get on the turbo lift. Yeah, and, and everyone has these very concerned looks on their faces. In sick bay, McCoy's hair is worse. It's <laughs> just, it does it's not his hair. It looks like Chekhov's wig that they just spray painted white. In his eyebrows. He's got some great eyebrows. I mean, the makeup they did on his face was great. I think so. Or maybe they just didn't give him any makeup and that's what he looked like. I don't know. But, uh. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's like what he really looked like. In sick bay, Spock has a question for the doctor. And Dan, they're standing around a table and there's this big phallic thing standing up between them. I want to know what that was. It's like a big phallic aluminum foil rod. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought it, it might have been a bong of some kind. <laughs> I mean, it looked like it. It was huge, but I mean, the, it was like glass or plastic. And then in the very center, it was like this aluminum foil. Yeah, I, I think McCoy and Nurse Chapel are smoking some bud that uh, Sulu's grown in the botany lab. <laughs> 
it's just so weird. There's, it's like between them. Like, who thought? Let's put this between the two of them. It was very odd. I I, I don't know what it was. It, it They never reference it. And you never see it again. No, uh, never. Never see it again. Yeah. Bach tells McCoy that he has adjusted the temperature in his room to 125 degrees. McCoy says, I'm not a magician, Spock. Just an old country doctor. Fox says, yes, I've always suspected as much. <laughs> <laughs> Even as Spock's getting old, he still has that little bit of acerbic wit. So uh, Spock leaves sick bay, and Stalker stops him in the hallway. Stalker asks Spock to take over the Enterprise as Kirk is unable to perform his duties. And Spock says that he is half human, and in this affliction has affected him too. Stalker says that Spock must conduct a performance competent... <laughs> Maybe Dan <laughs> should conduct a performance competency hearing for Captain Dana over here. <laughs> yeah, if anyone had to conduct one of those on either of us, Dana, in order for us to do the podcast. Never be out there. No. Mm -mm. Let me try this again. Third time's a term. Stalker says Spock must conduct a performance competency hearing for Captain Kirk. And in sickbay, McCoy has checkoff on the examination table and says, now This isn't going to hurt a bit. That's what you said the last time. Did it hurt? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, he gets a great line. Kirk is in there, and just then Galway comes in, and she collapses in Kirk's arms. And McCoy checks her and says, she's dead. So we see the competency hearing take place. Kirk says it's unnecessary, and Spock asks Kirk if he would like to make a statement. And Kirk says, I'm the captain of this ship. Let's call the whole thing off and get back to work. <laughs> Not exactly the opening argument of Perry Mason there. So uh, <laughs> Spock says that is impossible. And Spock questions Sulu about Captain Kirk repeating himself. Spock then questions Uhura about the Code 2 thing. Then Spock goes to McCoy, who is sleeping. <laughs> He wakes him up, and McCoy uh, had given Kirk a physical, and then Spock asks the computer to relay the information. The computer states Kirk is between 60 and 72 years of age and aging rapidly. And Kirk says, no, that's not right. I'm 34. When Kirk says he's 34, is this the first time we learn, like, his exact age? I think so. Spock asks about Kirk's mental degeneration, and McCoy responds, yes, but he's a better man right now. What does that mean? <laughs> He's a better man right now. Yeah, he's he's becoming a moron, but in in the big scheme of things, he's a better man. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> but Dana, what about Scotty right now, who's also at the competency hearing? He's just sitting there. I don't even think he says a word during this. Oh, he doesn't, and he looks like, I mean, talk about competency. I mean, it's, <laughs> I was really worried about Scotty. Yeah. Uh, he did not look like he was in the party at all. I mean, in fact, he doesn't even really have many lines in this episode. He has a few, but but he is just very, very old. I mean, he does look older than anyone else. When asked if he would like to call any witnesses, Kirk says, I'm perfectly capable of speaking in my own defense. Kirk then says, there's only one reason and one reason alone for having this hearing. I refuse to leave Gamma Hydra 2. And Spock says, Gamma Hydra 4. Spock then recaps the testimony and says it's obvious that uh, Captain Kirk is impaired. And he asks Kirk to leave so the board can vote. And he looks around the room at his crew. Everyone looks at him as if they betrayed him. This was a pretty touching scene. The look that Spock gave him alone. Spock just looked like he was really sad. But it's obvious they all feel terrible about this. And Commodore Stalker says that he's going to assume command. Then he orders Sulu to set a direct course for Starbase 10. And Sulu asks, across the neutral zone? And Stalker says, immediately, and tell all officers to get back to their posts. Don't you think Spock would have jumped in here and said, hey, hold on, hold on a second. You, you know what the neutral zone <laughs> is, right? Yeah, you'd think. In Kirk's quarters, Dr. Wallace and Spock enter. Kirk says, I've been relieved, and Spock confirms. Then Kirk starts going off saying Spock wanted to assume command, and Spock says, I have not taken command. He says Commodore Stalker is in command. And Kirk has a fit, calling Stalker a desk-bound paper pusher. And Kirk orders Spock to take command. Spock says, only Stalker can issue orders now. And Kirk goes on the attack again against Spock. You traitorous. 
disloyal. You stab me in the back the first chance you get. And again, we get this kind of like hound dog hurt look from Spock. In sickbay, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Dr. Wallace are talking. Kirk is much older now, and he has more hair than he had before. So Kirk says there has to be an answer. He says, we beamed down together. We were together all the time. And Spock says, no, not all the time. And Kirk says, check off. He went into that building. He was scared. He saw the body and was scared to death. McCoy starts thinking about it. Adrenaline activity. And he goes, I read something about that once. Right after the atomic age, it was used for radiation sickness. And I got a comment. McCoy, his whole body, everything he's doing, really, I mean, he's like an old man. He's, he's slightly bent forward. His body's kind of like shaking a little bit. Really impressed me. I think more than anybody uh, while he pulled it off. I think DeForest Kelly really did a great job with that. I agree with you. So then Spock says perhaps a sufficiently efficacious compound could be developed. The next thing we see is a kind of a quick montage of Wallace, Chapel, and Spock working on formulas uh, for this cure that they're are looking for. And then we go back to the bridge with Stalker in, com- in the command chair. Sulu announces they are entering the Romulan neutral zone. Stalker says to Uhura, Lieutenant Uhura, let me know if we contact any Romulan. I think we just made contact, sir. <laughs> I love that line. And Sulu reports that uh, Romulan's approaching from both sides. And then Uhura says engineering wants orders. Chekhov asks for orders. And Stalker just looks confused. In sickbay, Kirk says he must go to the bridge. And McCoy stops him. And Kirk keeps saying, I've got to go to the bridge. And Chapel and Wallace help restrain him. The ship keeps getting rocked. In sickbay, Kirk is complaining about the greenhorn running his ship and that he needs help. Spock comes in as the ship is is rocked again and he's holding like a little beaker and he says he has produced the serum but there was no time for refinements it could cure or kill doctor don't give me any vulcan details Spock. just give me the shot Kirk says he will take it first as he needs to get back to the bridge. Wallace gives him a shot, and right away Kirk starts writhing in pain. Okay, I got to say something about this, though. The camera angle. Yeah, it's like between his knees and his crotch. (laughs) It's right on his crotch, and he's just kind of lifting his crotch off the bed, you know, in agony. and, And they showed it at least two times, maybe three times, of him just thrusting his hips up into the air. It was very odd. And I was wondering what Wallace was doing to him at that point yeah so so (laughs) mccoy goes what on earth's happening over there he suddenly became foghorn leghorn (laughs) that's exactly right wallace says uh the aging process has stopped the bodily functions are returning to normal so on the bridge stalker says we have no alternative but to surrender and Chekhov states the romulans do not take captives Wait, you got to do the Russian. I thought I did. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so Stalker looks defeated. Kirk appears on the bridge looking young and virile again. Uh, Sulu gives him the report about being surrounded by Romulans. Stalker leaves the command chair. He's probably like slipped out because there's a pile of poop in it. Yeah, he had to Schmidt himself when the ship was under attack. Yeah. Kirk calls to engineering, telling them to be ready to go to full warp power. And then he goes to Uhura and asks her to open a special channel to Starfleet code two uhura looks at him funny and says but captain code two and kirk stops her saying that's an order code two so we as the viewer are kind of wondering wait does he not remember that code two's been broken by the romulans right so we're we're kind of confused at this point a little bit kirk says have inadvertently encroached upon romulan neutral zone surrounded and under heavy romulan attack escape impossible shields failing will implement destruct order using corbamite device recently in installed. All Federation ships will avoid this area for the next four solar years. Explosion will take place in one minute. Kirk commanding Enterprise out. And Spock reports that the Romulans have backed away just as you expected them to. And Kirk opens up a channel to the ship, says all hands, warp factor eight now. Spock reports the Romulans were taken by surprise and we have escaped. Kirk cancels the red alert and sets a new course for Starbase 10. And Stalker's like, finally, finally, (laughs) you're getting me back to Starbase 10. Look at the situation I had to put you in to get me to Starbase 10. Yeah. (laughs) So Stalker apologizes saying he was trying to do the right thing. And Kirk says there's very little a Starbase can do that a Starship can't. And Stalker says, I'm very aware of what a Starship can do with the right man at the helm. 
I mean, Dana, the guy is a Commodore, right? Yep. Don't you think he would know what a starship could do? I mean, do you, do you get to be a Commodore in Starfleet without having spent some time commanding a starship? I mean, it'd be like being an admiral in the Navy and never having spent time on a ship. I just don't think that happens. Yeah. You, you're you not the requisition officer in the Navy and getting to become an admiral. You know? Yeah. No, I agree. I thought the same thing. So McCoy comes on the bridge and he looks younger again. He says, Scotty is recovering. He says he pulled a muscle during the reaction but otherwise he's fine what muscle did he pull dana <laughs> he said in his back oh okay <laughs> maybe it's uh his uranus muscle i don't know so that's <laughs> <laughs> Well, there is a sphincter. Is the sphincter a muscle? It's got to be a muscle. So you would think so. I mean, there, there are several sphincters, right? You got a sphincter in your throat. Yeah, your nose is a sphincter. Yeah, so. <laughs> is it really? I think so. <laughs> okay, I got to look up. Okay, hold on. So how do you spell sphincter? Okay, how many sphincters in the human body? There are over 50, Dana. There are over 50 distinct types of sphincters in the human body. I think the eye is a sphincter. Some are microscopic in size. Okay, well, here are some. You got something called the Houston's valves. That's interesting. Internal anal sphincter. That's a good one. The sphincter of OD, O-D-D-I. Uh, the iris sphincter. Yeah, you're right. Okay, there we go. So 50, 50. If anyone's wondering how many sphincters there are in the human body, over 50. Oh, wow. see, and once again, people learn something from listening to our show. Yeah, that's right. McCoy turns to Spock and says, anytime you're ready, Mr. Spock, and Spock replies, I am quite ready now. And McCoy says, uh, because of your Vulcan physique, we've prepared a specially strong dose for you, and you'll be happy to know we've removed all the breakables out of sickbay. Including that glass pipe with the foil in it. Including Nurse Chapel's bong. Yeah, so it's a... <laughs> <laughs> As they leave, Dr. Wallace enters the bridge. Kirk goes to stand next to her, and we see that he feels like a small twinge of pain. And he says, in all the experience, he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do need a competition. competition. I can't even say it. We do need one of those things. We should have our wives give us the competency hearings. Oh, you know, we would never pass. We no, would never pass. Yeah, I could just see it. Even if we did pass, they would say we didn't. So it's a, Right. They'd be shipping us off to some nursing home someplace. I hope we could be together at least in the same place so we could wreak some havoc. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody looking at us, those poor guys. Maybe that's how people look at us now. That's why we don't do live shows, Dan. That's yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so as they leave the bridge, Dr. Wallace enters the bridge, and Kirk goes to stand next to her, and he feels a small twinge of pain. He says, all in all, an experience we'll remember in our old age, which won't be for some while. Sulu says, steady as she goes, Captain, and Kirk responds, I thought I said that. And then there's a reaction shot of Sulu and Chekhov, where Chekhov is wearing a bad wig. <laughs> so it was taken from a previous episode. Yeah, the, the wig raises its ugly head once again, Dana. It would have been funny if they put it on after they'd been on McCoy and it was white. <laughs> <laughs> But that's how the show ends, Dan. So, Dan, you got a couple notes about a couple of the actors, don't you? Yeah. The guy who played Robert Johnson, not the blues singer, but the old dude from the planet, he did not start acting until he was 73 years old. His son was in Hollywood, was an actor, and somehow got his dad into acting. I think his dad was like an insurance salesman or something. The crazy thing, Dana, this guy was born in 1882. Wow. 1882, right? So just think of the stuff he saw. Everything from the invention of the automobile to airplanes to rockets to people not landing on the moon yet, but certainly orbiting the moon by 1967, and then being on this sci-fi show. I just think it's kind of cool. He shows up in a lot of uh, TV shows in the 60s. Don't imagine he had a long career. No, but it was memorable. Exactly. And then the woman who played his wife, Laura Wood, she was also born in the 1880s, born in 1889. And Dana, you had some information about the actor who played Commodore Stalker. Yeah, that was uh, Charles Drake. He appeared in movies in the 50s and 60s, uh, most notably uh, Winchester 73 with James Stewart and also uh, Harvey with James Stewart. In the uh, 60s and 70s, he appeared in a lot of TV shows, including Mannix, Macmillan and Wife, and Harry O. And he appeared in over 85 movies. Wow. And he was a guy that was a salesman before. 
So, uh, Dan, do you got any themes or dilemmas you want to discuss? For me, one of the themes in this episode is how much value do people have as they age? You know, and I don't know about you, but, you know, I'm in a time in my life, I'm 62 years old. I think for our generation, 62 is still relatively young, right? It's for our parents' generation, 62 was old. Yeah, yeah. Um, but people are healthier now. I think our diets are better. Well, ours aren't any better, but somebody's diets are better. But, you know, it's just how much worth do people have as they age? age. And we see a real bias against old people in society. I mean, heck, we, you know, on the show, we kind of make fun of them and make fun of adult diapers and that type of thing. I don't think either of us feel that older people don't have value to society. But it is something I, you know, I think about sometimes and even struggle with a little bit. Well, it's funny you should say that. I was, a uh, question I ask is, do we toss our elderly aside and do they offer nothing? Yeah. I think uh, my boss, I've told you, is in his 80s running the whole company. The owner of the company is 79, still very active. He's our chief technology officer. I think we have a different look at aging now than we did when we were children. So, Dan, I think we need to uh, cherish our older people and appreciate what they've uh, done for us and hope that we can be as uh, intelligent as we as we age. Well, we're not getting more intelligent, Dana. I mean, that's clear from the podcast, but that's not <laughs> happening for us. <laughs> The other thing, too, that I found really, I would say, somewhat touching about this episode is that with the exception of only two of the actors, they're all dead. You know, when they filmed this episode, they were in the primes of their lives. They were young and they had to put on this makeup. They had to be thinking at the time, wow, what is it really going to be like for me when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old? Am I even going to live that long? So that that was also kind of touching looking back on this. One of the things I read is uh, somebody made a comment that they actually aged better in real life than they did on the show. So, Dan, let's move on to the best and worst. Do you got any best parts for us? One of the best parts for me was the makeup and how the actors portrayed themselves as they aged. I thought that was pretty well done. How about a best part for you? My first one was uh, the aging and uh, the actor's performance uh, as they got older. Exactly the same for both of us, yeah? Yeah. What about another best part for you? I love the Romulan Bird of Prey ship. I We mentioned this in an earlier episode where we got to see those. I just think they're cool looking ships and I like the bird design that's on the underside of it. How about you, Dana? How about another best part for you? The return of the Corbomite maneuver. I just thought they brought that back. I thought it was classic. It was, it was great. Dan, you got any worst parts you want to talk about? Is it too obvious to say the wig, Dana? McCoy's wig or Kirk's wig or both? No, I meant, I meant Chekhov's wig. <laughs> It was just odd that they recycled a scene. It was from a muck time, apparently, but it, that they recycled that scene at the end. Why not just put in a scene without the wig? I, I don't get it. Yeah, you know, they were always looking for cost savings, and so they reused a lot of scenes. So, how about a worse part for you? Dr. Wallace. Yes. And as we said, she didn't really add anything to the show. Do you got another worst part for us, Dan? Exact same thing. Didn't understand what that whole backstory was about, except they needed an endocrinologist, maybe. How about another? worst part for you, Dana? Uh, no, Julie Newmar. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, when uh, Stalker was in control of the Enterprise and showed he was completely inept, why didn't somebody just throw him out of the chair? Why didn't Sulu or you her? I mean, they were going to die. <laughs> So, Dana, what happened on this day in history? Dan, this was uh, released on December 8th, 1967. And one of the interesting things I saw, Dana, about this episode, it was the 41st episode produced and it was the 41st released. Is this the first time in all of the ones we've reviewed where the production number was the same as the release number? I'd have to go back and look at that, but I, there haven't been many if there's been any. Yeah, n none jump out to me. And this one did jump out because of that reason. So, I'm just wondering if you had that same reaction. U.S. Air Force Major Robert H. Lawrence, uh, the first African-American selected for astronaut training, was killed in the crash of an F-104 Starfighter at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Dan, it's weird, but it'd be more than 10 years before candidates other than white males were selected for the NASA space program. In 1983, Jan S. Bluford Jr. would become the first African-American astronaut in space. Also on that day, a Magical Mystery Tour was released by the Beatles as a double extended play album with a total of six songs from the television movie soundtrack of the same name. 
December 9th, hundreds of children and their parents in Evansville, Indiana, were witness to a tragic end to the arrival of the shopping center Santa Claus in a used 300 helicopter. Santa was set to land at 3 p.m. in the afternoon in the parking lot of the North Park Shopping Center in Evansville. As many as 2,000 children had come to watch the event. The copter clipped three electrical power lines as it prepared to land, then... <laughs> <laughs> Dana, I have tried not to laugh. This is horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It is horrible to laugh at this. This is really a tragedy. It really is. Can you imagine the kid? Poor kids have been scarred for life. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I put this in here. But I got to tell you, when I read it, I thought it was just too stupid to be true. You know, so. Oh, God, that is horrible. I've never heard that story before. Never. So let me finish it. Oh, God, there's more. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so the copter clipped three electrical power lines as prepared to land, then crashed on pavement that had been cordoned off for the landing, killing the pilot and William Bretz, a 59-year-old tool and die maker in the city's Whirlpool factory. Wait, was he the Santa? Uh, That's what I'm assuming. Wow, no reindeer were hurt? Uh, Reindeer, no better than to fly into power lines. Oh, that's horrible. I mean, Dana, really, I, I feel bad even about laughing. My God, that's really tragic. And just to top that, on December 10th. Oh, no. God, no. What's next? <laughs> they killed Rudolph. <laughs> <laughs> On December 10th, R&B singer Otis Redding was killed at the age of 26, along with four other members of the Barkays and a pilot when their plane plunged into Lake Monona in Wisconsin at 325 in the afternoon. Wow, Dana. I hope you've got a story that Gets us out of this funk because this is horrible right now. Yeah, everything else was about the Vietnam War. These were the cheery stories. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Wow. It was a tough, that was a tough week, Dana. Tough week. Yeah. So sorry with the, uh, with the downer ending there, Dan, but, uh, that's what was going on. And I always wondered what happened to Otis Redding. I knew he had died, but I didn't know how. Well, just think of all the rock stars that have died in, you know, plane crashes. I mean, Buddy Holly, the big bopper, uh, uh, Richie Valens, they died, right? Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, helicopter crash. Some guys in Leonard Skinner. So the moral of the story is if you're a rock star or a Santa Claus, do not get in an aircraft. Ricky Nelson. Wasn't he freebasing or something? He was freebasing. <laughs> Next to an oxygen tank or something. Shouldn't be laughing at this either. <laughs> My God, that's right. He was freebasing. Yeah. Uh, John Denver. That's right. Wow. Hey, Dan, let's do the counts. Yeah, let's do it. Let's start with the dead crewman count. What do we have this week? This week, we have got one Lieutenant Galway. So we've got a total of 38. Shirtless Kirk, rip shirt Kirk count. All right, Dana, we are two for two. So we got a total of 13. And the he's dead count. McCoy says she's dead. We've got a total of nine. Next, we have I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. But Dana, I say we have one on this one. I, I don't know what your thought is, but he does say I'm not a magician, Spock, just an old country doctor. I think we should count it. What do you think? Wow. I really thought he had to say I'm a doctor, not a escalator, but I can be flexible. I think we counted one earlier where it wasn't the exact terminology, I really think we should count it. Okay, I'm changing it in my count sheet. So that takes us to eight. In this episode so far, Dana, we have four categories fulfilled in this episode. Have we ever had four in one episode? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Okay, Dan, what about the supreme being count? No, nothing even close in this episode, Dana. So zero total of eight. And violation of the prime directive? I don't think so. I I didn't see where that happened at all. I say we have zero for this week for a total of six. And takeover of the Enterprise. Well, Commander shit for brains. <laughs> tried to, but he didn't do a good job. Uh, No, we didn't have any takeover the Enterprise this week, so we were stuck at five. But it was a pretty good week for our counts, Dana. Yeah. So, Dana, what episode do we have next week? Dan, it's another good one. We're going to raise the counts once again with obsession. Once again, I had a great time. I really did like this episode. Had a lot of fun talking about it. I will see you next time. Yeah, Dan, this was a great episode. I really enjoyed watching it. Always a great time talking to you. Great to hear from our listeners. We uh, look forward to hearing more from you soon. Until we meet again, live long and prosper. Thanks once again for listening to Damn It Jim, the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. 
Dan and Dana are off next week, so there will be an encore presentation. But in two weeks, join them for the episode Obsession. Enjoy the rest of your week, and until we meet again, live long and prosper. <laughs>